If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Hi, I'm Rachel Johnson. Thank you for joining us on Common Ground. This week we tag along with nature photographer Mark Harlow as he gives us an in-depth look behind some of his more famous photographs. And the Great Twin Cities Poetry Roadshow stops in Bemidji. We'll talk to Sean Hill and other Minnesota poets who present their creative compositions. I'm Luann Shepard Mom. I teach high school English and I'm also a poet. I'm here in Bemidji reading as part of the spoken word series for the Bemidji Community Arts Center. This reading is part of the Great Twin Cities Poetry Read Roadshow and I was joined today by one Bemidji poet, Sean Hill, and Paula Chizewski, and Matt Mock from Minneapolis. Peter and I workshopped this poem in there um, and it made it into my book. So, it's called Prayer for the specialists who sooner or later will be tasked with fixing me. <laughs> Trying to cross Hennepin Avenue at night when it's varnished with rain is dyed by lights of clubs and 24-hour commerce so that it looks like an oriental rug, like the chicken who's just been told the joke about the chicken crossing the road and doesn't get it. I stop in the middle of the street, wonder what tricks a surgeon fixing the body uses. If a patch is worn over the eye that sees the luminescence inside, so a vision of staple and stitch, a shaved sternum, the distance of an imagined end a few hours from now is the thing that allows hand and scalpel to impose order at the heart, a heart that, when you're close in and it's dying, must transfix like a blossom un unfolding in a time-lapse film, must be as hypnotic as car horns and city noise converging to make song, like they're following a score you swear they've spent yours and your parents and your grandparents' lives rehearsing. In the middle of the street, heart of the city, incandescence and fluorescence whisper, neons shout. Can you remember where it was you were in such a hurry to get to? Well, reading in the round robin style that we read in here is a lot of fun for the poets because we try to find connections between our poems. And we were just talking about the fact that we end up reading poems that we sometimes don't read, usually. We all kind of have our set that we do of our poems that we read. But when someone reads a poem and then one of yours, uh, one that you don't normally read, has a thematic link, then you read that one. And it's fun to try out some new poems. Um, it's also, sometimes when you read for 15 or 20 minutes at a stretch, I'm always conscious of, I feel like people are getting bored by the end and it's too much of the same voice. So this, this style of each of us taking a turn really helps with that. I'm Sean Hill. I'm a poet and uh, I helped organize this event today, uh, the Great Twin Cities Poetry Read Roadshow in Bemidji. I wanted to bring uh, poets from outside the area up here that people might not get to hear, different voices. I was energized when I went to the Great Twin Cities Poetry Read down at uh, Normandale College um, last year and heard 25 to 30 poets reading, you know, a poem each and got to hear sort of a, a bunch of different styles, different aesthetics, um, different voices and um, I want to bring that to Bemidji, um, you know, so people could hear poets like Matt and Paula 
and you know to sort of celebrate you know poets in the area like Luann, get some, some the, the voices here for the folk, and I, I think. Poetry and poetry readings, I, I, I've in the past found that they, they're places where I, I sort of am nurtured emotionally and um, creatively. Um, good poetry readings make me want to create, and my form of creation is writing, so you know, I, after good poetry reading, I want to go home and write. Um, I, I, I hope that this sort of, this art will sort of in, in, inspire, invigorate. That's, that's what I, I want my work to do, and that's what I want the work that, you know, my fellow poets are sharing to do for an audience and that's what I was hoping to accomplish here this evening um, with the, the community members who came out. I'm Paula Shazewski. Uh, I was born in Bemidji and I've lived around the Midwest. Uh, I live in Minneapolis. I've lived there for quite a long time now and I'm a poet. Uh, I have a book called uh, Ghost Fargo that uh, I was reading from tonight and another book called Upon Arrival. There's some new poems. I'm part of the uh, Great Twin City Poetry Roadshow. Uh, that Matt Mauck put together right now. So, um, yeah, and it's great to be back in Bemidji because I was raised here for my formative years. So, I had hosted other events um, and other series in the Twin Cities, um, and Matt and I knew each other. We had read together, he had read at uh, my events, and then um, he's just so inclusive, you know, that I read at the, the inaugural uh, with, with Luann and about 30 other people. And uh, so uh, it's been really lucky to, to be able to be part of it, you know, and to be able to come back up here for this first one. Well, I'm, I'm a poet and a teacher, and I, I live in the Twin Cities. And uh, I go to a lot of readings in town, and you always see different groups of people at different readings and, and different styles of poetry being read. And, and I thought it'd be great if all these people could come together and, and do a single reading once a year. And so. I came up with this idea, the Great Twin Cities Poetry Read, um, 25, 30 poets, everybody comes, reads one poem, uh, had no idea how it was going to work or not that first year, and it, it turned out to be a success. So we did it a second year and had just had our third year this year at uh, Hamlin University, uh, was the location this year, and we had 250 people there. and. After each year's um, reading, all the poems read get anthologized in Poetry City USA, uh, the, an anthology um, of the poems read at the Great Twin Cities Poetry Read, uh, plus essays, reviews, interviews, and it's become, it keeps growing and growing and growing as we have all these ideas. And so the, sh the, the show at Bemidji tonight was the Great Twin Cities Poetry Read and Road Show. And so taking this out on the road, and then we have a standing reading series at a place called Maves Cafe in Northeast Minneapolis. And so again, just bringing, celebrating poetry and community and, and, and bringing as many voices to as many people as we can. I wish I could take credit, but it wasn't my idea. Um, just before the event tonight, um, Sean Hill got us together and said, hey, why don't we just sort of all read at once and, and play off each other. Um, so none of us really knew what was going to happen tonight. Um, I haven't done a reading like this before, but I agree, it, it, it was very exhilarating. Um, it felt to me, um, as I said during the reading, like, like jazz, like it must be to play jazz, you know, riffing off of everybody and playing and seeing how far you could go and coming back. And, and so it was very exciting and is something that I, I want to continue doing. The format for this reading uh, is maybe a little different from the traditional poetry reading that people think of. Um, we uh, took turns reading poems uh, throughout the reading, so we would all just sort of you know, read one poem or two poems and then sit down and let the next person read. Um, there are four of us here today, uh, Matt Monk, Luann, Paula, and myself, and um, we sort of handed off uh, the microphone, as it were, um, after one or two poems, which is different from the, the normal poetry reading format where usually a poet reads for sort of a block of time, maybe you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Um, we were just you know, sort of trying to bounce off each other and have a conversation with our poems. Um, it's, it makes for a very uh, sort of spontaneous kind of reading. I find when I do it, um, I become a more uh, attuned listener to my fellow poets because other readings I'm usually just kind of thinking about what I'm going to do. Um, in this case I'm trying to have a conversation with my fellow poets and so I'm really actively listening um, and you know ready to answer. Postcard to Nostalgia. 
When did my life become the stuff of nostalgia? I overheard a guy in the bar on the corner ask his beer the other day. I didn't know you had a new bow, and this one's long distance too. He reminds me of my younger brother, who when much younger, sputtered in the ocean after the first wave took the land he had been standing on. Waterlogged and hornswoggled, his goggles now around his neck, no longer a green horn to what's to come or what can come to pass. In this new city, my barber insists on cutting my hair to lessen my thinning, wanting to get back to a me he didn't know. I've taken to carrying words in my pocket on a slip of paper. Each morning, I reconsider them, and again at noon and midnight. They are my last words, or what I intend my last words to be. It's always one of my favorite things. I think it's something that, that we all look forward to because it is so solitary, the coming together and the sharing what you did in solitude. And to read this way especially. Uh, I've had a friend who used to call it horse. Like you, you start from the same spot on the, on the floor, you know. Um, I, I love it because you're really listening for the commonality in all of the poems, you know. And, and I always love hearing who I read with. I, I prefer to read in group readings, but in this way, it's so fun to hear that like, mm, yes, you know. I started writing poetry as a child and then abandoned it and didn't take any poetry writing classes in college. I was an English education major going for teaching. And then I was assigned a creative writing class when I was teaching in Woodbury, Minnesota. And I started writing the assignments along with my students. And that's where I discovered or rediscovered writing poetry. And I think most poets will tell you we write poetry because we can't not write poetry. I mean, once there's, once you have that way of expressing sometimes really difficult things, sometimes happy things, um, it's addictive. It's a, it's a great form of expression. When students want to start writing poetry, the first thing they need to do is read poetry. So many people who write poetry sort of proudly say, I write poetry, but I never read it. And that's a frustration for, for people teaching poetry writing. Um, nobody would say, I'm going to write a novel, but I've really never read one. Um, so educating themselves in, in poetry and the styles of poetry is helpful. And then just trying things. It's just a matter of putting pen to paper. One of the things I tell my students when they say, poetry, we hate poetry is that they have more poems memorized than any other age group because they don't make the link between poetry and song lyrics. And I think so many people are intimidated by poetry because it's been poorly taught or not taught at all or they just weren't, it didn't hit them at the right time in their life. But I hope that people will understand that po there's something in poetry for everyone. I guess it sort of goes back to this idea of, like, for me at least, um, poetry being about um, sort of training the gaze on something and um, being attentive. I, I was one of those kids who um, often daydreamed and gazed out the window, and, and um, my gaze was always about sort of like studying something, being, you know, looking at something closely and letting my mind kind of wander. And um, that, that for me, turned out not to be conducive to um, writing stories. I, I wanted to be a writer. Um, I, I had this, this idea, because I was a reader, I wanted to, to do that thing that I was, I was reading. I wanted to, to write words too, write stories. And stories didn't come to me, but once I found poetry, um, it allowed me to, to actually sort of express myself and explore ideas in ways that I, I couldn't in, in, in stories or even essays. I think a poetry reading in a community brings people together of like mind. Often people who attend poetry readings are writers themselves or readers. But I also think it's writing poetry is such a sharing of the self and for people to come and listen to that is such a community building true connection between the audience and the reader. I think people should feel comfortable not necessarily understanding poetry on a literal sense all the time. 
or worry that, that they don't get it, you know, and, and really gravitate to poetry that they like and that moves them uh, without worrying about if it's good or, or not, you know. Uh, there's a lot of poetry out there and there's something for people to, to like. So. Coming to an event like this, uh, coming to a poetry reading as is like a cheap vacation. You get to go to a lot of wonderful, weird, new worlds um, in one evening. Um, yeah. There are just there's a lot of, of you know sort of tentacles with the, with the poetry road show and the Maeve session. So it's if if you want to know more about it, it's good to check out the website. Um, the Great Twin Cities Poetry Show, the Great Twin Cities Poetry Read and Roadshow .com has tons of information. We're updating that, so that's a great place to find information and to contact me if you have questions. Hi, I'm Mark J. Harlow, H A R L O W, and I'm a professional nature photographer from Breezy Point. When did I realize I was a photographer? Before I had a camera. I would go out with my father who was an avid outdoorsman. Took me out hunting and fishing and trapping and uh, I would see things even at a young age that I would often repeat back to my dad. Did you see that or look at this? I was very observant as a child. Once I got into high school and took photography in high school, I really uh, got in, into it. I mean, I really, really liked it, the photography. The image we're looking at here is called Guardian. The reason I'm smiling is because it's such a special image. This is a very powerful image, very uh, spiritual to me anyway. And what I went through to get it, <laughs> it was painstaking. I had saw this eagle sitting down by the river in the winter, very, very large eagle. And so I hiked down to the river, and of course, they don't call them eagle eyes for nothing. So she saw me coming in. But I, I went down and um, had all my snow cam on and just laid behind this old, big down cottonwood uh, timber area and um, just hung out there. And I thought, oh, I'll give it a half hour, see if, if she'll take off and if she'll fly it towards me. So six and a half hours later, I was starving and shivering and running out of light and during the day it would snow then the sun would peek out and it was kind of a magical day in itself even though I didn't think I was going to get a good photo but uh, right towards the end of the day I was watching two juvenile eagles hopping around on the ice chasing each other and just caught a little glimpse in my right eye and turned and looked and here she came and she was flying right at me and then she would look to her left, look to her left, glide. And she was probably about a quarter mile away. I mean, she was quite a ways away. So I had time to get ready. And then as she's getting closer and closer and closer, um, she had locked her wings, the wind had tipped her. And all I did was pop up over the log like this to take a picture and she swung and looked at me. And I got the picture and she took off. But it's just the power that I felt when she turned and looked at me and busted me that quick. I mean, how she saw me, I just, I don't know, it was a pretty amazing thing, but I learned from the ground level and continued on after high school with, you know, shooting nature mainly, mainly outdoor scenes in black and white as well. And that was back in the old film days. I don't know if you remember those or not, but uh, I, I love film still to this day. One of the things that may set me aside from other photographers is my adamant, stubborn technique of how I photograph. I shoot single mode photography exclusively, one click. I do not speed shoot anything ever. And part of the, well, the main reason is, is I consider myself a traditionalist um, and a minimalist with my photography. I like the challenge of taking one click, one frame, and capturing that image as is with the right light, with the right composition in one click. I do not hold the button down and speed shoot five or seven or eight frames in one second. That's, to me, borderline video work. Well, this is one of my top five favorite grizzly bear photos of all time, and I have many, but uh, 
This image was taken in Alaska, and this is called Alaskan Thunder. And as you can see, there's water and spray going everywhere. And this bear was a little close. She was about 30 yards from me, less than 100 feet. And I had saw her dive and miss a salmon and shake, and I wasn't prepared. <clears throat> so I missed the photo. And then she came closer and closer, and she was actually so close I could smell her. They have a bear have a musky scent, and um, I sat up high so she knew where I was. And she got used to me after a little while and came closer and closer. And then finally she dove for the salmon and missed again, cocked her head, and all this while I had time to slow my shutter down because I had envisioned this shot that I missed earlier, uh, getting a neat action shot with the water actually slurred and rotating. So I actually had time to slow my shutter down and get ready in case she did shake again. And again, it worked out perfectly. She looked right at me, cocked her head, and I knew she was going to shake, and she shook, and click, one click. That's the image. Well, as a professional photographer, I have a lot of equipment and a lot of favorites. Today, I'm using one of my favorites. That would be my Nikon uh, 300-2.8 lens with autofocus. It has very fast autofocus on it, and I shoot this particular body is a Nikon D300. I also shoot um, D700 as well. I have three D300s and one D700 that I still shoot. Great optics are critical to great photographs, especially when you're doing wildlife and subject matter that's far away. I use a tripod as a last resort, not a first choice. Well, if I had to describe my image editing process, uh, it would be very simple, very minimal. I really strive to get as close as I can to what the scene is showing to me. With a lot of work and studying and technique, um, you can get very, very, very close to what the human eye sees. So there is a minor amount of editing that's required. And then you have to go in and prepare a high-res image for print. I build a template with the title of the image, uh, copyright information, and size it to the size that I want. And then whether I'm going to print a, a paper print or a canvas, it's two different substrates, same process. And the time it takes me to print one 30-inch print, just one, if I had that same image on a traditional litho press for art prints, at a minimum I could print 4,000 art prints in the time I can just print one. So my prints are four and a half times the resolution of a traditional art print and a much wider color gamut because my photos stay in the RGB color field. So it's not that I'm gaining anything or gaining that much more, it's that I'm losing less. Behind me are two pretty special images of true wild mustangs. And when I say true wild mustangs, uh, both the Dakotas have wild mustangs. One's on a private ranch, one's at um, Teddy Roosevelt Park. Both fairly confined small areas. The first time I've been physically shaken scared was with His Majesty. And this is a wild stallion that came up from behind me while I was sitting on about a 50-foot drop-off looking at another group of horses. But on this particular morning, this gentleman and uh, seven others came up from behind me. I didn't know they were coming. And all I heard was a loud snort and the hairs on my back and my neck stood up. And I turned around with my camera to my face. And that's what I saw about 30 feet away. And he was not happy that I was there. So thankfully, I got out of there without getting injured or worse. In October 2009, um, Lakeshore Dreams did a feature article on my nature photography and in this article is His Majesty Mustang amongst others but it's a really neat story on the road that kind of got me here and if you want to learn more about that article and and my path to where I am today that article again is on my website under the news section. What is a retro recycle program? Well I've spent most of my adult life in the printing industry and what I've found because I publish all my own work is that I can now retrofit any of my prints into an existing frame. And that way you don't have to worry about spending money on framing right now in these tough times. 
and you can give your living room or bedroom or business great makeover. Uh, one of the things I like the audience to do is if you go hiking in the woods, one of the little tips that I do and encourage others to do is to carry little uh, grocery bags with you that you get from the grocery store because unfortunately too many people litter. I take a lot of pride in doing truly wild wildlife, truly authentic nature work, meaning it's the best of the best as far as what, where I'm at, what I'm doing. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed looking at some of my work. I have said many times I take zero credit for the beauty of the work that I do. I give that glory to God. I'm just fortunate enough that he puts me in those positions and situations to capture and represent all the beauty that's out there in nature. I've been a perfectionist my entire life and I refuse to use lower end methods for the work that I've tried and worked so hard to capture. I take an extreme amount of pride in capturing all these magnificent images in just one frame. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Common Ground. We'll see you next week. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. To view this episode or any Common Ground segment, visit us at lptv.org. individual segments or entire episodes of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people on November 4th, 2008. If you enjoyed this episode of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.